Hey guys, what is up? Well, my house batteries are not being charged by the alternator while we're underway. We're going to deal with this problem right now. Details coming up on RV Street. Okay, let's get right to it. My house batteries and my chassis battery is always charging simultaneously while we're underway. Now, right now I'm plugged into shore power and my battery charger to the house batteries is on. And let's take a look at the current state of charge right now. You can see my current state of charge is 13.2 volts. They also charge the same way when I'm running my onboard Onan 5500 generator. Now let's go unplug from shore power. Back here at my digital readout, you can see my current state of charge is now 12.9. I'm unplugged from shore power, therefore my battery uh, converter is not on. Now let's go start the engine. You can see my scan gauge right here and shows that I'm charging 14.1 volts. So that's how I monitor this while we're underway. Now let's go back to the battery bay. You can see here that my house batteries now are at 12.5. They normally, when the engine is running, it's about 13.6, 13.7, 13.8. It just depends on the state of charge. So it's basically the same or a little lower since I started the engine and it stays this way no matter how many uh, miles that I drive. Here is my battery bay that is under the steps. I have two six volt Trojan batteries, golf cart batteries, wired in series. And then I have my chassis battery right over here. So let's test the chassis battery first to see if it's being charged by the alternator. So I put my multimeter on the chassis battery and you can see right there, it's charging at 14.44. Now let's test the house batteries. So you can see there, it's about 12.4. 12, 12 so I know that the alternator is charging okay. It's charging the chassis battery fine, but it's not charging the house batteries like it always has when the engine is running. Well, motorhomes have several different kinds of battery management systems or battery isolating systems, and they go by different names. In this first diagram, this is a bi-directional isolator relay delay. <laughs> it's also known as a bird system. Second, here's a typical diagram of another setup called a bird and a big boy setup. And third, then there's a BIM system, a BIM, battery isolation manager. This is what I have, and here's a picture of my setup. Now, all of these different battery isolation systems uh, accomplish the same thing, only in a little different ways. Not to worry, I'm not gonna overwhelm you here. I'm not gonna get into all the different details and of all these different systems, because if I did that, this video would have to be hours long and it would make your eyes bleed and, and your head spin. But I'm merely mentioning the three most common uh, systems that are in motorhomes because more than likely you're going to have one of these systems in your motorhome. So I highly encourage you to research and study the kind of battery isolation system that you have, research it, study it, and know how it works. Because I can tell you, if you keep your motorhome any length of time at all, uh, you're going to need to know that information, at least the basics. And this video is going to show you those basics and what I'm going to do to fix this problem in our motorhome. Now let's go back to this diagram right here. This is a typical bird battery isolation system. At the top, you have the bird control box. This is the computer. The bird operates in conjunction with continuous duty solenoids to provide the isolator battery charging functions of a motorhome. At the bottom left, you have the house battery's disconnect solenoid. And on the right, you have the chassis battery disconnect solenoid. These solenoids 
determine what batteries are going to get charged and when. In the center, you have the isolator relay solenoid. On my system, Winnebago calls it an auxiliary start solenoid. On the dash of your motorhome, you have a battery boost toggle switch. This switch is for when your chassis battery may be too low a voltage to start the motorhome. So when you press this switch to on and hold it, usually for a couple of minutes, I mean, that's the best practice, what that does is that auxiliary solenoid engages and links right up to your house batteries to start the coach. Now all three of these solenoids, they have contacts in them and they're constantly engaging and disengaging. Are you with me so far? <laughs> okay. So in summary, you have your house batteries, you have your chassis battery or perhaps two chassis batteries and they are controlled by a battery isolation system of some kind like this bird system does in that diagram I just showed you. Now I don't have a bird system and I don't have a bird and a big boy system. I have what they call a BIM system, B-I-M, Battery Isolation Manager. Winnebago went over to the BIM system, I think around 2012 or so. Here's a picture of my BIM system. With a BIM system, there's no thinking or is computerized controlled. It's either on or it's off. When my house batteries stopped charging while we were underway, I knew exactly where to start looking. Let's go to where my BIM system is in my coach. So when we bought this coach, this is a 2012 Winnebago Vista uh, 35F. We bought it in uh, 2016. And this bay right here behind the front tire is where my BIM system is along with some other breakers and fuses. As soon as I bought this, I immediately started doing a lot of research about this coach and discovered that particular bay right there was very prone to getting rainwater off of the tire while underway. And the, at the factory, it had really short little mud flaps right here. So I thought, well, we're gonna fix this problem right off the bat. So I made some really wide long uh, mud flaps and the box under here, that particular bay, I used a really good uh, uh, rubberized material and I sprayed and completely encapsulated that bay uh, with a rubberized material so there's no way any water can come in from the front, the bottom, the top, it is totally sealed to prevent uh, any corrosion and water getting in there. And this has worked great for six years. I've actually absolutely had no problem whatsoever. Then as part of my electrical annual maintenance that I do every year, I'd always pull this front panel off and I'd inspect all my solenoids, the connections, make sure that there was no water intrusion, there's no arcing going on, and I would spray an additional little uh, battery post protectant on the contacts just to preserve that. And I've been doing that for the last six years. Absolutely had no problems. But I'm going to make a confession here. You know how I'm always saying, perform uh, PM, preventive maintenance. Do preventive maintenance first to prevent things from happening in the first place, right? So here's the picture of my system inside here. And these solenoids in here are known to go bad. Now, over the years, I've made a friend of a mechanic uh, online, and uh, the guy's a really sharp guy, and we were discussing this, and he said, you know, Martin, he said, in these motorhomes, these solenoids really should be changed out about every five to seven years. He said, if you have a 10-year-old coach, you definitely need to change these out if you want to be proactive, because if you don't, you could do something as simple as drive into a gas station to go get gas, then come back in the coach and go to start it up and it's not gonna start. These solenoids can go bad just like that without any warning. So my confession is, is I know better than that. I should have changed these two or three years ago to be proactive, but I got lucky. Uh, this coach is 10 years old, have had zero problems. 
but now the house batteries are not being charged. And that's a telltale sign that one solenoid has gone bad. The others are probably getting uh, ready to go bad too. So I'm going in there today and changing everything, all three solenoids and the relay. Now I'm 99% confident that what we're gonna do today is gonna fix my problem. But even if it doesn't, it doesn't matter. These three solenoids and relay has to be changed before bigger problems start to arise. So here are the parts we're gonna to replace today. So these are the two outside solenoids, one for the chassis battery and one for the house battery. They're rated for 100 amps each. They are continuous solenoids and I paid $52 each and these are in my Amazon store. This single post center solenoid is the auxiliary start solenoid. Amazon didn't have this particular one, so I bought it from Winnebago and paid $72, and that included shipping. And right below this one, the center one, you have the relay. This is a five post uh, Tyco relay. I also could not find this on Amazon, so I ended up finding it from an electrical supply house online, and that was $17, including shipping. So all in all, all these parts were $193. On this solenoid, they have a warning label here, and they're telling me that when I put the wires back on, I have to hold this nut, and the outside nut, the compression nut that goes on here, should not be more, uh, tightened more than nine foot pounds. Well, my foot pound torque wrench is way long and it's a little too big for this confined area that we're going to be working in. So I'm going to be using my inch pound uh, torque wrench, which is a lot smaller. So I converted nine foot pounds and that converts to 108 inch pounds. But I'm not going to go all the way to nine pounds. It says to not more than so I'm gonna to torque these to eight foot pounds and convert that to inch pounds and that's 96 inch pounds, okay? So I'll hold the nut, put the wires on, put the crimping nut on the outside here and tighten it to 96 inch pounds. So even on these electrical parts, they're calling for a proper torque. I just covered that uh, a little while ago when I did the main breaker box and the transfer switch, remember? Uh, and some people say, ah, that's not necessary. Just get in there. Well, we covered all that. It is necessary. And uh, we explained all that in the video that I did uh, prior. So torque in these is important. Now, as you can see here, uh, this is really tight up in here. But first we need to prepare the coach to work on it safely. So we are disconnected from shore power, remember, that's important, and the generator is not running. Now let's go back to the battery bay. Now we're gonna disconnect the batteries. If you take off the positive cable first, you could create an electrical short, especially if anything metal touches it. So negative cable should always be removed first and replaced last. So I'm going to disconnect the chassis battery and the house batteries. Okay, so the batteries are all disconnected. Just about ready to get started here. And just as a safety precaution, because your system may be a little bit different than mine, but we're going to take my multimeter and we're going to turn it to 12 volt. All right, so I'm going to take a probe positive and put it to ground. And check this other post over here. I have no power anywhere, so it's safe to work on. Got my rubber gloves on as usual, my arm protectors. And for those of you who don't know what these are, these are tube socks that I buy at Walmart. And I take and cut them off at the heel and I slide them on to protect my arms. Constantly wrenching on stuff just like this, get scratches and gouges on my arms. This protects my arms. You can see I have all my tools. I've anticipated every, all the tools that I'm going to need, including my uh, inch pound torque wrench. So everything is right here. It should go fairly smoothly. And before we get started, I just wanted to remind everybody and thank everybody that uses my Amazon store. Everything that I use in a video 
any video. Uh, those parts and gear are in my Amazon store. But what is so awesome is so many of you loyal fans, every time you need something at Amazon, you'll click my Amazon store link first to go to Amazon. And if you need gear, well, fine, you can shop for gear in my store or just shop on Amazon for anything that you normally would get on Amazon. Put it in the cart and check out. Using my Amazon store to shop for whatever you need is a great way to say thank you, Martin. Thank you for taking the time to doing these videos and helping the RV community. So I want to thank you all so much. Those of you who are new to my channel, the link to my Amazon store is down there in the description text. So thank you guys so much uh, for wanting to support us using our store. It's been this such a blessing. Okay, I'm going to get started on the left solenoid. Joni, what's the time right now? 105. 105. Okay, the first problem I've ran into here, uh, this uh, solenoid is mounted to the bay with two screws, one here and one here. So I tried to back that screw out and it was tighter than all get out. On the back of the bay here, and those screws have nuts on them. And I put some penetrating oil on those and went to break these nuts. And those nuts just stripped out. It's like they put Loctite or something on these screws. I mean, they're just unbelievably tight. So now what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to grind these all off. So I just got through grinding off the uh, first nut there. And it went real smooth. It took me about a minute. The way I ground those nuts off is with my handheld grinder. And yes, I do keep this with me. So I went to the store and I got new nuts, flat washers, lock washers, and nuts. And as I was going to the store, I got to thinking, I want to show you something here. And these are my good wrenches here. And I got to looking at this and that wrench is bigger than this nut. So even after I put the wires on here and put that outside nut, I'm not going to be able to torque that nut down right because this wrench is too thick. So while I was at the store, I bought a cheap set of wrenches and I'm going to take this half inch wrench and I'm going to grind it down right here so it'll be thin enough to hold that nut and not interfere with me torquing this correctly. So I got the second nut ground off and I just wanted to point out I wore my long sleeve shirt and I asked Joni, she gave me her, her winter cap because as I'm grinding, those sparks are all flying around and I wanted to protect my hair and my body. And here is the first solenoid right here. So I'm going to take my needle nose pliers and that's on that back post right there. So I'm going to take a little bit of dialectic grease and put it on this spade connector here. This doesn't help conduct electricity, but what it does do is it keeps moisture out and makes it easier to remove and insert in. So I'm going to put that back up in there and it's locked into place. And then I'm going to take my fuse and go ahead and put it in here and then take my other fuse on this side and push it in. And once again, just make sure that these wires are good and seated, and they are. Then I'm going to take some Never Seize and put it on there with a flat washer. And this will go inside like this and bolt this way. And I'll put the nut, the flat washer, and a locking washer on the back side. Okay, so we got the two new mounting bolts there. And that solenoid now is mounted. And now what I'm going to do is hook up the wires back up to there. So I got this first solenoid all in and these torqued here. Now I'm going to move to the center solenoid and I'm going to leave those mounting bolts on there until I get these big lugs broken loose. Okay, so I got the center auxiliary solenoid uh, replaced. 
So now I'm moving over to the right solenoid. Okay, so I got all three solenoids replaced. And the last thing I need to do is replace this relay. Look how loose this is. This is the circuit it plugs into, and this is the relay itself. So I'm gonna pull this relay out. I'll show you what that looks like underneath there. So I pulled the relay out. It's a five prong relay. And look how loose this is. It's held on with a screw right here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna back that screw out and I'm gonna put some blue Loctite on there and screw that back in. But the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna take some ElectroClean and I'm gonna clean out those contacts in there. So now I'm gonna take some blue Loctite, not red, and that's really too much. All you need is just about that much right there. I'm gonna put that back through there. I've been down here uh, troubleshooting this unit and I tightened this relay up before it got loose again. So that's why I've decided that I need to put Loctite in here. We don't need to have this relay harness bouncing around while underway, right? Okay, that's good and tight. Now we'll take the relay and put it in here and snap it down inside. There's all the new studs and the nuts. And what I'll do is I'll come back and I will wipe all this down with acetone and paint this so it doesn't rust. Okay, so well that looks really good right now. Uh, what's the time, Joni? 420. 420. So even going to the store and coming back and having to grind all those bolts off and all of that, uh, hour, uh, what, three hours and 15 minutes. So now what we're gonna do, we're gonna go hook the batteries back up. Okay, so remember, we're still unplugged from shore power. So our house batteries are still at 12.5. I've hooked up the batteries, both the house and the chassis battery now. And I made sure that my chassis battery is on and my house batteries are on. So let's go start the coach. Now that I've started the engine, you can see my scan gauge is recording right here. We are uh, charging at 14.2 volts. And my house battery digital readout is also saying 14.4 volts now. Okay, so let's verify this uh, on the batteries themselves with my multimeter. So we're gonna put the positive probe there, negative probe on the back, and look there, 14.4 volts on the chassis battery. That's good. Now let's do the house batteries. So we're gonna put the positive probe on there, negative over here, and we're getting 14.4 volts. So the alternator is now charging both sets of batteries like it's supposed to be. And this is why I say, guys, you guys can do this stuff. 80 to 90% of the maintenance and the PM items and upgrades that your RV needs, you guys can do this stuff and save a boatload of money. Uh, that just costed me what? 193 bucks in parts, I think is what it was. And that took me, what, three and a half hours? We'll just say four. And that included me going to the store and back. So remember, if your solenoids in that isolation area don't make the mistake that I did and, hey, everything's working great, don't need to look at it. No, those things do fail. And I happen to get a quick heads up uh, by my house batteries not charging. I could have gotten stranded somewhere. Uh, luckily, I did not. Now, like I said, there are several different ways these different systems work. I mean, they have the same outcome, but there's little differences in, in all of them. I don't pretend to be an expert or know all of them. So please don't send me a comment or a question asking me to help troubleshoot your particular system. You need to do what I do. You need to get online and study your system. So you know your system 
And if something like this comes up with yours, you're going to know exactly the part numbers to use, how to check different things, and how to perform a replacement parts on your coach. Just make learning a priority in your life. That's it. If you want to learn more about how to take care of your RV or install upgrades, just click my logo right under this video and that will take you to my YouTube homepage. On my homepage, you'll see the playlist tab. Click that and every video I've ever done will be right there on that page in different categories. Or as another option, you see that magnifying glass in the upper right hand corner? Click inside there and type what you're looking for. If I've done a video on that subject, it will list it. Anyway guys, that's it for now. I hope this video will help you solve some of the problems that you may be having with your batteries charging from the alternator. So until next time, this is RV Street. Stick around.